Okay, well welcome everyone to week five of seven one th week seven one three four EDN um, new technologies and um, learning or learning and new technologies and uh, we have here um, Nav and Beth with us and if there are others of you wishing to join please send me an email or respond to the emails that I've sent you. So how are we going with the readings and with the assignment? Who would like to go first? And Well how about the readings? Um, last week we had some readings on ICT and ICT integration and this week we've got some readings on educational gaming and the use of virtual worlds in education. And welcome Patricia. <laughs> so I won't embarrass people by asking if you've done the readings um, but Perhaps you've done the readings for last week. Um, do we have any questions from what we discussed last week or the weeks prior to that before we get on to this week's discussion? Or do we have any questions about the assessment? Um, you've got your first assignment coming up in well, it's due in about three weeks, I think, um, week eight. But you do need to get that started in order to get the Delphi um, process completed um, in time to actually write your scenarios based on those Delphi results. Don't be too concerned about the accuracy of the tool. Um, you're not being assessed on how well you use the tool. Um, we do want you to describe the results of your questions, um, but you may find that you have to get those via email or other approaches if the tool does not meet your expectations. But hopefully you will be able to use the tool. It does allow a little bit of an anonymity in the Delphi process, which is important for uh, proper research, so it's good to try to model that. But the reality is you, you really just want some advice on different um, possibilities around technology and what's going to happen ed in education in your particular circumstances so that you can then write about those in two scenarios. So any questions about your assignment? Hi Jason, Beth here. Hi Beth. Hi. Just, would you be able to just talk a little bit, bit about those scenarios just to sort of work out where we're going with those? Just a bit, bit of clarity, that's all. Okay. Um, let me just bring up the official document so I can refer to that. Um, so essentially you write two visions of what may occur in the future um, based on the responses that you've had from your Delphi survey and also your own system modeling of your particular organization and where they're at, where they're looking at going and some of the challenges um, that they may be facing. Now you'll find those challenges uh, summarized in the Horizon reports that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Um, so if you're looking at different different things that might occur in the future, um, there's some good approaches to explore. But we'd also like to then try to narrow that down to your own particular circumstances and that's where we're using the Delphi process to gather up some um, expert opinions on what they feel might occur in the near future. And we could just then have you write one particular scenario but Scenario writing is a um, futures uh, research technique that is used to try to get people to envisage different types of futures. So not to feel that there is only one particular future that you're trying to determine, 
but the fact that there are many possible futures that may occur and you're going to try to influence things to go towards a particular future but it may turn out to go to a quite different future or many there may be diff many different possible futures that might emerge as new technologies evolve and so forth so future studies scenario writing is a um, important approach to ensure that you're not just considering one particular uh, predetermined future but that there can be many alternatives um, and often that's um, like best case and worst case um, if everything goes well you might write about how things might occur in one scenario if everything goes poorly that might be another scenario or it might be two different technologies that could be implemented in your school or two different approaches um, there can be a range of different ways that you can structure your scenario writing but I don't want to limit you down too much in that it's simply two views of the future based upon the research that you've conducted through your Delphi process your systems analysis and your readings into the material provided in the course Um, and I imagine like a fair bit of referencing is this sort of like you know do I need a lot of referencing like an academic sort of thing or how, how much of that are you talking about because I mean I can no. talk about strategic plans and stuff like that as well but what do you want what do you think no in this case referencing is not a huge aspect mm -hmm. and I don't think I've even given a criteria for that um, so no because you are relying a lot on opinion um, it's you're not trying to actually come up with the correct answer of what's going to happen in the future uh, the point of doing scenario writing is not necessarily to come up with what is going to occur but it is to allow you to consider many different possible alternatives um, that will then help you when you come to doing your implementation plan so that you can then um, see different approaches to achieving what you want to achieve and there may be one particular pathway that will achieve one thing um, but there may also be other pathways that will lead to equally um, ambitious and uh, preferable outcomes but may be quite different to the first one that you originally considered um, so in a particular school that will remain nameless it might be that every student will use iPads and write their own iBooks and all the teachers will use iBooks all the time and that might be one particular approach but there may be some disadvantages and problems with that um, say when they go off to university and no longer have those resources um, or other students coming in from other schools not having experienced all of those um, engagement with those um, digital texts having to then come up to speed with using those technologies so there may be things that you could explore in terms of the future around that and different things that could be implemented in that, in that environment that could assist with that um, but there may be then other technologies that could be incorporated if virtual reality becomes a big thing that you wanted to incorporate or in terms of the things that we're going to be discussing this evening if you wanted to incorporate things around computer ga gaming um, or virtual worlds and how that would fit in within the particular ecosystem that was evolving in the school um, and there may be then different pathways that that might approach um, maybe digital text won't be as important because there'll be a whole range of other technologies that will also be incorporated or digital text might remain very important and um, these new technologies might be incorporated into the use of those texts okay so there could be a range of different pathways that you might then explore in terms of developing scenarios about what might happen in the future thanks Jason nice and clear thank you so Patricia and Nav, do you have any questions or specific things you'd like to discuss around um, that first assignment? Uh, Actually, I have many concerns, but uh, maybe it seems silly to you. <laughs> no, it I'm, because I'm not a technology person. Uh, I'm struck in a like a simple uh, system model model. Yeah, if I uh, like uh, want to make a for my organization like back in India, mm -hmm. what kind of like the, uh, 
unstruck system model I have to make what will be in the future and or what they are using now. Okay, you make sense. <laughs> Your system model generally models what is happening at the moment. Um, it's used to sort of look at what is currently occurring and all the influencing factors um, that are impacting upon what's happening in a particular um, learning environment as it is, exists now. Um, means uh, in the context of uh, technology? In the main, yes, because that's the, the nature of what this course is about. But there could be some very important other um, social factors or economic factors or government influences or social influences, uh, parental influences um, that may all have a big impact upon that. Um, so there may be issues around gender or opportunities in terms of uh, workplace. There may be a whole range of careers that are particularly associated with that particular part of the country that may have a big f impact upon uh, people's decisions around what sort of uses of technology would be put in place in that particular circumstance. So they're the sorts of things that you, you identify in a systems analysis. Um, all, the, all the factors that you might need to consider when you start thinking about, okay, if we're going to implement some technology in that particular environment, what would that have, what, what would that mean in terms of all the other influencing factors? If the parents are going to be really against it, then that would be an important thing. But they may be very much for it. Um, but if they can't afford it, then that may be another aspect that needs to be incorporated into your planning and decision-making processes. Okay. And uh, another concern uh, is like um, I'm thinking of making like uh, questions that I had put in Delphi, stu uh, Delphi study. Uh, like uh, what kind of um, questions I have to Put, uh, means it's about the again uh, I'm have confusion it's about the future or like if I, I want to ask about the impact of the technology okay particular so, uh, technology tools like okay in the main we, we use the Delphi study to get advice from experts so so far with your systems analysis you would have identified a range of different issues related to your particular learning environment. Um, yeah. But there may be some things you'd like to know about um, what impact, say, a new technology might have. Um, you've got your own experience, but drawing upon expertise can assist and give some val validity to those opinions that you might have. So you might feel that introducing tablet computers into um, the, the school might be a good idea. But it would be a great thing to do to ask the experts whether or not they think that would be a good idea. Okay. And I mean, to, make, to make that a little bit easier, you give them a range of choices. So not just tablets, but a whole range of other technologies that they might consider. And by ranking those, you can then see which ones they think would be most effective in that particular circumstance. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I can send you a little draft like because I'm... That's fine. You can send me through some questions and I can um, give you some advice on those. Um, but essentially, think through what we're aiming towards at the end. We're looking to develop an implementation plan of how to successfully utilize technology in your particular learning environment. So the Delphi study is going to inform that. So we want to come up with some good advice from the Delphi study that will help you make decisions when we get to the implementation plan. There's a whole lot of stuff we still need to learn about implementation plans yet, but it's what we're using the Delphi process for is to gain some sort of consensus as to which things would be most likely to be useful in um, improving the use of technology in the particular learning environment. So that should be guiding your questions. Okay, got it. Thank you. Patricia, do you have any questions? No, it's all good. Thank you. Okay. Um, just check to see. So I know there's a number of other people that were trying to join us this evening. Um, just trying to see where they may be at. So this week we're looking in particular 
at two new technologies, um, educational gaming and virtual worlds and virtual reality and those technologies. Has anyone had any experience with the use of computer games in education? No, I have not any experience. Okay. Anyone else had any experience with the use of computer games? What about normal games, um, non-computer games? Yes, I usually do some non-computer games uh, because I have the, I have a, I had an experience have an experience of teaching mathematics, so I do uh -huh. some kind of games with the students. Yes, now mathematics is a good example. Um, it's a good drill and practice game that is used um, a lot in schools to practice students' um, mathematics um, skills. And Beth mentions that they're currently trialing English stars. Um, so mathematics is a computer um, tutorial based um, game where students complete maths problems but they do so in competition against other students um, trying to do them in the quickest time and to be uh, the most accurate. And because it builds that competitive factor into the solving of math problems um, students find that more engaging than simply doing them uh, without a gaming context. So Mathletics is, a, is one particular sort of computer game but there are many, many types of computer games um, and they're being used in education quite extensively um, but not uniformly at this stage. There's still something that is being explored in many schools uh, but there are lots of teachers and schools that are exploring the effectiveness of computer games um, to support education. Patricia, do you have any examples or experience with computer games in education? No, not a great deal because um, the school, obviously, we yeah, everyone has mathletics. But typically, um, SEP students are excluded from them on the grounds that, oh, there's one, I call it monkey magic, but... Uh, COGMED, the school pays, I think, $300 per student, but the special needs kids are not allowed on there because um, it's too frustrating for them. So mm -hmm. on the, you know, yeah, it's just, it just annoys me, Jason. We have a couple of our kids this year who are graduating. One is going on to a maths degree, he hopes, and the other hopes to study law. So mm -hmm. to say that those kids, therefore, have such impaired executive functioning that they're going to like throw the laptop out the window out of frustration is just rubbish. So, and that's one of the things that annoys me in special ed that people get told things um, like, you know, ASD kids have impaired executive function. Yes, we know that, but it affects each person differently. And instead, schools tend to just do a blanket. Therefore, none of those kids can do this. So, at the moment, no. Well, I don't even know if any of our kids have. Oh, I think, yeah, they're allowed onto mathletics, and that's about it. Well, that's a little disappointing, and and maybe something that you could work towards in your implementation plan. Because um, certainly, from my perspective, I've always seen special education as uh, trying to fight against those particular uh, opinions and perspectives, but I can see how bureaucratic processes can often uh, take the, the safe approach, um, but that's where educators need to uh, provide their professional opinions or professional advice um, to address those particular perspectives. Okay, so let me share the screen and we'll have a look through some of the readings for this week. So I've given you two um, 
texts to have a look at. Uh, one is on educational gaming and one is on virtual worlds, but we'll have a look at educational gaming first. Um, there's some background reading. Um, gaming is based on play and if anyone is following current debates in early childhood education, play is certainly at the forefront of um, debate uh, with early childhood edu education try to retain the concept of playfulness in the in the schooling process um, as opposed to the more formal curriculum uh, instructional approaches. So a lot of good stuff that can be brought into around play related to gaming um, where much of our early learning and indeed much of learning has occurred through play-based uh, approaches. Um, and that play can be simply seen as a form of mimicry. Uh, you can imagine that once upon a time when we were going off to learn how to hunt or to learn how to gather f foods from bushes and so forth, um, much of the learning process was by watching adults do the same thing and playing our own little games with toy spears or picking from various bushes, learning the processes um, that adults were going through, but in a playful way, um, not in the serious way that adults would have been doing. And that goes all the way through to much of learning as it used to occur in the apprentice system. But then when we got into formal schooling, we moved away from uh, mimicry and example-based learning and moved towards um, different approaches. But gameplay and gaming can be a, a means of bringing some of those aspects back into education where we can include a lot of simulations where students can try out being um, different roles and different responsibilities in society uh, from running a city in SimCity versus um, being a soldier in a combat game to being a driver learning how to drive on the streets and a whole range of different types of games that can exist. Um, so I've given you a fair bit of research base there around the different categories of play and approaches um, computer gaming um, and these can include things such as um, just uh, daydreaming and fantasy based play. Um, we see that enacted in role-playing games and in uh, many dr drama type games. Uh, some games are solitary, um, but there's also a lot of games that are done through interactions with other people. And uh, in the playground, we see those all the time with students coming up with rules for different games, playing Tiggy and uh, catching games and ball games. Um, and there's a whole range of other types of games that you can explore and have a look at. Then there's a little bit of theory about the rhetoric of play, um, how we actually define and explain play, um, and some videos there that can uh, highlight some of those aspects. Um, we won't go into the theory too much, it's not particularly important, but just to understand that there's a whole range of um, research bases to the use of play and the use of games in education. Um, it's not just using games as time fillers or drill and practice. There's a whole range of aspects. Uh, now James uh, Gee has identified a whole range of principles that we can look at in using computer games. Um, but again, I'll leave that to your reading. There's a bit too much there to go through. But there are really, there's really two different um, sorts of educational gaming. Um, there's the traditional gaming that we know about that mirrors what students are using games for entertainment outside of um, school. But there's also a concept called gamification. And this is where we take the concepts of playing games and we apply them in different circumstances. Um, now, one of the most common ones of these is around badging, where we give badges or rewards for students for achievement. Um, and that achievement might be good behavior. 
So they might get gold stars for um, behaving themselves in class, or you might have a, a leaderboard where they get points. Um, Harry Potter films or books um, had a system of get, getting points for different houses um, based upon their performance in various activities. But gamification can go through a whole range of different areas of society. Um, you'll see things such as oh, McDonald's often has a, a system where they give out little game, game cards and little stickers when you buy various um, products and you can build those stickers up to make words. I think they use the Scrabble game as their basis and they're using gamification concepts to sell products. But probably the most common example of gamification would have been in the, in the scouting and girl guides movements where students earned badges. Um, so they did various achievements and they were re rewarded with those um, through a badging system. And badging is being incorporated into a lot of, game, a lot of educational environments at the moment uh, where we're giving uh, formerly it's called micro credits uh, so we're recognizing various achievements students have made and giving them some credit for those um, using a badging process and they get enough badges they can then use those for particular re rewards such as maybe passing a course um, or getting some other value from those processes. So in your classroom experiences have you used gamification in any particular ways that you could explain and give an example of? So has anyone used any elements of gamification? Have you ever given um, re reward stickers or badges or um, gold stars, smiley faces? Hi. Look, um, we don't do a lot of that at this stage. I mean, simple things like I have a show me account where the kids put in their work and that, and you can give them rewards and things from doing that. Uh -huh. um, that's probably the closest thing. We do mathematics and as I said we're trying trialling this English stars where you can actually give feedback like it's an English, obviously an English program but there's a lot of grammar and writing in there and you can actually you do a lot of modelling and then you work together as a group to answer questions and then the children individually answer questions and then you give them feedback from that. Uh -huh. So that's that seems to be working for us now big drive for us now is like STEM and all that sort of thing. No, I, yes, I do understand. Um, but in, in some cases, people can even see the whole schooling process as being a gamification, uh, where students have to learn the rules of schooling and they receive reward through assignments and recognition and high grades for various performances that meet those rules. Um, so there's a whole range of levels that we can see gamification at. Um, there are some concerns around gamification. Uh, there's concern that say the uh, insurance industry is getting on board with gamification and the idea is now that if you go to the gym you'll get some uh, a reward in a reduced uh, premium on your insurance payments um, and a whole range of things that is being considered by insurance companies such as giving you a little um, device, a Fitbit that you can wear on your body and it measures your physical activity and if you get a certain number of points of that each week then your premiums will be lower um, because you're being physically active and um, so forth. And the same thing may progress through in terms of the food that you eat. Um, but how much we want to allow external bodies to influence our choices um, around food and exercise and lifestyle etc um, is an interesting dilemma that companies are exploring at the moment. How far they can go 
um, with requiring people to modify their behavior um, based on rewards and punishment systems. Um, but particularly in insurance and healthcare, that's an area that they're exploring quite um, seriously. Um, and there's been a couple of movies made that look at the extremes of this sort of uh, behavior where we may get to a point where everything is monitored and we're re rewarded or punished uh, based on our behaviors um, in rather extreme ways. But do we have any other examples of gamification in your classroom experiences? Okay, I'll move on. So the other area of educational use of games is around what we call serious games um, or games that we use for a particular purpose. And for education, that main purpose is around learning. And there's a few examples here of the different types of games, um, ad advertising-based games, which I sort of talked a bit about, um, edutainment games, which are the ones you'll find on mobile devices. Um, but there's also games that are specifically designed for learning. Um, mathletics would be a good example there. But there's a whole range of other types of games and simulation games and news games, and we'll talk about some of those in a moment. Um, a few more different types there, exercise games, art games, um, training games, um, health games that are designed to sort of improve people's health. Okay, um, well I'll go, I'll just push on then. Uh, the next bit is a little bit of research that I've been doing around a concept called secondary worlds. Now this was actually developed by um, J.R. Tolkien, as part of his research, he was actually a researcher, not just an author. Um, but he came up with this concept that we create for ourselves uh, fictional worlds when we read books or watch movies about particular um, fictional environments. And if they're detailed enough, we can go into what's called suspension of disbelief, where we can um, make believe that that, real, that world actually exists. We know that it doesn't really exist for us, but we, we can believe that it can exist as a fantasy world. Um, and computer games can very much help that process, where students can be so immersed in a game that um, they will accept what occurs in that game as real for that game. So they don't believe it's real for the real world, but for that secondary world, for the, for the world of that game, it is real in that game context. And they can engage with that. And that becomes important when we look at learning. Because then they can take what they learn in that world as real learning. So if they learn how to drive a car in that virtual world, um, then they can believe that they are actually learning how to drive a car. And they can then tr ideally then transfer that learning from the secondary world into the real world. Um, but more commonly we see that they, they start to experience things around um, relationships of other people, how societies work together, how governments work and interact um, geopolitically and all of those sort of issues it's much easier for them to comprehend those concepts in a secondary world because that secondary world by its very nature is simplified. Um, whereas the real world is built up with so many complexities and so many dramas and um, issues that it's difficult for them to see the interactions between various aspects of the real world. But a secondary world, because it's been built around game mechanics which have to be very much simplified, they can often see those interactions in much more detail. So there's a little bit of reading there to um, take you through um, the concept of secondary worlds. But the big advantage of computer games is over 
um, text, which is what Tolkien was originally writing about, or movies and other um, devices that students immerse themselves so much in that they understand all aspects of that uh, fantasy environment. But the big advantage of computer games is that we can actually then make changes to that environment. We can actually be what's called co co-creators. So we can actually change part of that environment um, through our actions in the computer game. Generally, texts and movies and so forth don't allow that level of interactivity, uh, but computer games do. So instead of just reading about how a particular society is dealing with slavery in a particular text, by being immersed in a computer game where they're having to confront the concept of slavery and potentially being a slave themselves and having to confront that process or being part of a, an economy where the option to engage with, with slavery is there and they have to then consider the ethical aspects of, of the advantages of engaging with slavery versus the um, economic gains that they may achieve through doing so and all of those issues becomes much more um, educationally beneficial than just engaging with a textual based or vi video based um, secondary world. So some reading there to help you go through that and um, I also give a bit of a link to the various types of games that are available um, and the types of roles that people can play within games and a model at the end called GPAX, which builds upon the TPAC model, um, which can be used for teachers in choosing games for particular circumstances um, related to the content they wish to teach, the pedagogical approach they wish to engage with in the teaching of that, the games they wish to use, and the students' interest in those uh, various aspects that we just mentioned. And the final thing there is um, a simulation called Sim School, where you can actually simulate a school or a class in a school. Um, you can start generally. Uh, I have my pre-service teachers do this, and we normally have them start with two or three students, uh, because managing more than two or three students becomes too difficult. Um, and then once they feel that they can competently manage two or three students, we give them a class of thirty, and they see how they sort of cross in into um, collective pedagogies where instead of differentiation and identifying individual students' needs, uh, they fall back on use of um, pedagogical techniques that uh, work for large groups rather than for individuals. Um, so that's what I use that particular simulation and computer game for. Okay, so that's just a bit of a brief overview of some aspects of computer gaming. Um, do we have any questions? Okay, all good. Remembering the intent of these sessions is not for me necessarily to be a lecture. Um, you've got the readings beforehand and works really well if you read those and come with lots of great questions to ask and we can then have an interactive Socratic discussion about the advantages and disadvantages of computer games or whatever particular thing we're talking about. But in lieu of that, we'll revert to the lecture. Okay, so the next concept is around virtual worlds. Has anyone got any experience with the use of virtual worlds in education? Does anyone know what virtual worlds are? Has anyone heard of a thing called Second Life? Okay, well, let's have a look at what they are then. So virtual worlds are essentially three-dimensional spaces where 
you're represented by an avatar. Um, that's myself over on the left there, which is a virtual representation of yourself in a 3D virtual space. Um, this is a virtual world I created for the university a number of years ago, uh, where we conducted lectures and workshops. Um, I'll just go through those, and so you can move around the space with your avatar representing yourself, and you can interact with various elements in that space and with various other people within that space. Um, so it's a little bit like a computer game, but because it's got different uses, um, most virtual worlds are not actually used for gaming. Uh, they're used more for interaction, uh, for social interaction, uh, for doing tutorials and um, lectures and things of that nature. But they do have various advantages. So for example, you might have a couple of hundred people attend a virtual lecture um, and in many respects it's the same as watching a video um, of a lecture, um, even a, a live video. But the advantage of, of having a virtual space means that you have a greater feeling of being there because you've got a, a representation of yourself in that space. And you can see that and others can see that and you can move around that space so it's a little bit like the differences between attending a conference and watching recordings of the conference presentations. Actually being able to be there and move around, talk to other people, and feel as though you're physically present at um, that event is quite different to watching a video of the event. Um, now virtual worlds are used for many different purposes. Some are for gaming, um, for for um, putting on virtual plays uh, where people can dress up with their avatars in different costumes and move around and conduct um, the play. Um, or it could be representing stories from storybooks and other things. But there's also many different ones. Uh, one of the ones I really like is um, called the Rocket Garden where every spaceship ever um, launched has been created in, in three dimensions and you can go and explore those and interact with them. Um, there's a whole range of different video clips that I've put in here that you can look at different uses of virtual worlds. The biggest virtual world by far is, a, is one called Club Penguin. And if you've got any very young children, um, it's almost certain that they've been using Club Penguin. It's just an incredibly popular virtual space for, for children. Um, and they can interact with each other and play games with each other, very simple games, um, but it's just very, very popular. Second Life is the most uh, popular um, adult virtual world. Um, now, Mishimina is a sort of an offshoot of virtual worlds and computer gaming, <coughs> and this is where we create little movie clips recording the movements of our avatars or computer game characters in that space. And there's lots of examples of how that's been done to create uh, a different approach to storytelling, um, where students use their uh, virtual three-dimensional avatars as characters in storytelling and give different voiceovers to those stories. Um, so the range of different tools that are used for virtual worlds, Second Life has been the most popular and largest scale one but it has generally been aimed initially at adults. Um, they did develop a teen Second Life um, designed specifically for teenagers with um, verification processes to make sure that only um, children were in that space. Um, but there's other virtual worlds. OpenSim is a very popular one at the moment, sort of building on that. Active Worlds was one that was set up specifically for schools um, and used for a whole range of different um, 3D virtual environments. Um, Quest Atlantis was probably the most famous of those. It was designed for students aged 9 to 16 and it included thousands of different um, learning activities that students could engage with. So it might be there was a whole Shakespearean space, a uh, whole physics space, whole biology space where students could go and crawl inside hearts and lungs and all that sort of stuff and get to understand uh, different elements. And so there's some of the studies. So there's 50,000 quests, 10,000 or 100,000 missions and 
over 50,000 students were sort of using that space. It's changed a bit and it's sort of moved into a new space called Atlantis Remixed, which is a little bit more game-based and um, designed to be engaging for students outside of school. But there's some stuff there you can read about those. Okay, so do we have any questions about virtual worlds and virtual spaces? Could you see those sort of environments being used in your educational spaces? So one thing about the virtual spaces is that they can be very useful for connecting students up around the world. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, virtual field trips that students can do to go to different spaces that have been created, like the Sistine Chapel has been created in great detail, uh, the Taj Mahal, the pyramids, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is a very popular one, um, all done in as virtual environments, so they're not recreations, well, they're not um, video of the real space, but as virtual spaces that students can go to and learn more about those spaces. Jason, yes. do, you, do you know of any sort of, I know you've just listed a few there, but for kids, like that looks really interesting for some projects and things that we could be doing in the future, but is it an easy thing for a kid to pick up? They usually get it better than we do and faster than we do, but is it something that would be manageable for let's say year three to six? Um, probably that, that age group is probably a little bit more problematic. Just above that age group is where Quest Atlantis really kicked in and was used as an engaging environment. Um, it's not to say that students younger than that have, haven't engaged in those environments. And Club Penguin and a lot of the other avatar-based games are very popular for young children. But as virtual spaces, um, there are some good ones that are released. Well, Minecraft is probably the, the most common one. Yes, um, yes. That's probably where you would see that space as a virtual 3D space um, being popular. Yeah. There are a range of other ones that are based around computer game consoles that I'm aware of that students can engage with. Uh, but the, the ones where they can actually create their own spaces, other than Minecraft, do tend to be more orientated towards adults uh, okay. or upper high school sort of level. No, um, no, just, I just like I, uh, when, once you started showing and going through a few things there, there are a couple of virtual worlds. I have seen that somebody demonstrate that a, a while back. But it would be just great if you could get the kids, as you say, to create um, characters out of stories and have, you know, there's so much you could do with it. I just wanted something for younger kids. There They'll is, absolutely. Yeah. And um, or I know you're not in Education Queensland School, but um, there was almost a, a huge big project for uh, a Queensland virtual world um, that almost came to, into being. It was all developed, but uh, the funding fell through at the last moment. It was part of the third round of um, their learning space that they were putting together. Um, but in that, a number of educators went and developed um, spaces around a whole range of stories, um, Shakespearean ones, and not, but a whole range of different storytelling environments that students could then go into and experience as they were reading the books and um, engage as characters in the stories. But we are seeing a resurgence in virtual worlds, uh, piggybacking on virtual reality. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about virtual reality a little bit later, but that's where we wear a headset. Um, and there are very, very cheap headsets now available from Google called Google Cardboard, where you can put a little mobile phone in or a, um, uh, what do we call them, the, the touchscreen um, iPods. Uh, they could slot into these and create a very simple virtual reality headset. Um, and that's a much more immersive environment than the two-dimensional screen-based um, virtual worlds. Of course, being able to look around the virtual world with your body provides another level of affordance into that space. And there's a lot of new technologies emerging um, around that at the moment that are being explored. Uh, we've got the Microsoft's HoloLens, which is going to be part of Skype, um, will be a very important technology. Um, we've got a whole range of very high-end virtual reality headsets that are coming into being. Um, so there'll be a lot of new changes in that space in education, uh, because virtual reality 
as simulations around training processes. So, for example, learning how to um, fix a car using a virtual reality headset where you're looking at a car, but you then see superimposed on all the various parts that you have to interact with um, are instructions and highlighting of different bits. Um, doctors are using that during surgery. So when they have to cut into a certain organ, um, highlighted on that organ will be various details about where to actually place their knife and how deeply to cut, cut and all this sort of stuff. Um, and in education, we're seeing the similar things. So learning about biology, being able to actually dissect a human being um, is something we obviously would normally never be have an opportunity to. But that's quite common now in virtuality spaces. So we can take the skin off and then look at what the, what the human being would look like without skin. Then we can take various other organs out and just see what, the, um, what it looks like in that sort of three-dimensional space, um, which doesn't really is not really conveyed in movies and textbooks and so forth. So Navel, Patricia, any thoughts about where games or uh, virtual <coughs> reality and virtual um, spaces might go? Just, just a personal comment. My, those um, headsets that you're talking about, mm -hmm. my husband was working on those 20 years ago for the military in the US. <laughs> 20 yes. years ago. <laughs> now they have been around a long time and yeah. they, they um, 20 years ago was when they had their first um, resurgence or first um, engagement. Yeah. Yeah. They then disappeared because the technology was at that point not really mature enough that they didn't go mainstream. In fact, um, when I was uh, first as a teacher, um, indeed at the school that uh, Beth is teaching at, I actually had uh, various virtual reality headsets um, 15 or so years ago, and we were using them in education then. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't become popular enough, and enough, there wasn't enough software developed to make them mainstream. So they yeah. died away. But there's a lot of big companies now. Um, Microsoft, uh, uh, um, Facebook, they've all got their own virtual reality headsets that they're investing in and they're betting a lot on this technology being the next way we interact with computers. So that'll obviously have a big impact upon education if we go down this pathway. But that's sort of things you can write about in your scenarios. It's only one particular pathway. It may happen and we may all start using these technologies and our digital books may be all virtual reality headsets um, in the near future. But it may not. We may go other pathways as well. The virtual reality stuff is good for, um, we have kids who have, especially on the spectrum, mm -hmm. um, major sensitivities, so a simulated environment is often much preferred so they don't have to cope with crowds either. So there's a lot to recommend it for, especially for the ASD kids. No, there is, absolutely. Um, mm. The whole area of gaming and simulation and virtuality is great for the for students that have difficulty coping with the complexities of the real world. Um, having an abstracted version of that world where they can learn about how various aspects of the world work in a very structured way, which is the nature of computer simulations and computer gaming, uh, uh, then allows them to build confidence in interacting with the more complex real world. Um, so there's a lot of good research happening in that area. Um, Jason, I think good teachers have always used elements of gamification, as it's like to be called now. You know, we've always put kids into teams and had, you know, um, earned rewards and all that sort of stuff. Um, the old, at the beginning of new units, because uh, from, I'm from an English teaching background as well, we, I would always start off with like an ethical dilemma that was going to somehow be related. So kids have always responded to that. They always enjoy that element and they, they're very good um, to learn through. But unfortunately, there's still a lot of teachers who think, you know, you're wasting, you're wasting precious time. They don't see the benefit of that. That's really the, the bit that we're now looking at moving towards. Um, we've always had behaviorism and um, processes where we influence students' engagement through various techniques. 
um, and yeah. gamification techniques are certainly part of that. But it's moving those processes into a more formalized, structured way um, where we can see the valid validity of doing that in a systemic way for all, all areas of education and at all levels is where this new approach to gamification and computer gaming is moving towards. Um, yeah. Whether or not that's always a good thing, because we could go too far, um, where everyone is doing self-paced instructional guides on computers that are all designed to suit their individual needs, but we leave out a lot of social interaction and all those sort of things. Yes. That's where a particular scenario could go quite badly um, in the use of technology. But likewise, it could be a very social um, aspect where we're engaging with students from all over the world with different cultures and different um, areas that they're having to cope with in a safe educational environment. Um, could be a lot of positives in that respect. So that's where we're getting down to that scenario writing aspect. All of these technologies can be used in many different ways in different educational um, settings. Um, and sometimes they'll be used positively, sometimes negatively, but that's where um, as you develop your expertise through this course and through your um, teaching, that you'll be able to make better decisions around those choices. Okay, well we've come to nine o'clock, but if there's any other questions anyone has or comments you'd like to make? Okay then, well we'll finish it up for this evening and I hope that you'll all engage with the readings for next week, um, which I'm just checking what they are. <laughs> what have we got next week? We're looking at uh, oh, learning management systems and learning analytics. So a little bit drier than gaming and gaming, gamification, but very much something that's um, highlighted in schools at the moment, particularly by administrations and management, uh, being able to manage the learning process through various technological tools and being able to analyze the data that's coming out of that as um, tools is very much um, on the agenda in many schools at the moment. So we'll have a look at some of those issues and hopefully you'll have engaged with those readings and you'll have lots and lots of questions and we'll have a great interesting discussion about those concepts next week. Thanks, Jason. Cheers. Okay, then. Good night, all. Good night.